thank you all for being here tonight. Um, this, this is actually the coolest thing I've done all day, so I, I really appreciate this, appreciate the opportunity uh, to do this. So uh, I'm curious, but before, before I jump into the talk, how many people have seen the film before? A lot, almost everybody, all right. Uh, I won't, for the, the one person who has not seen the movie, I, uh, I promise no spoilers. Okay, so there are like seven people. You're welcome. Um, all right, so can I have the next slide, please? So one theme that you will see throughout the film is this theme of choice. Um, and particularly as a psychologist, I love this theme in, in, in the context of addiction. And I think this is one that people really struggle with as you try to understand uh, mental illness in general and addiction in particular, one of the things I think really befuddles people is how are these diseases of behavior and also diseases of the brain? How is this a disease? Can I have the next slide? So this, this is a quote from Nora Volkov, who's the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, who says, drug addiction is a brain disease. And you see this in the media and you hear this in many places, and this is really the public health message that addictions folks such as myself are trying to get out there, that this is a disease. This is not a moral failing, this is not a moral weakness, it's a disease, like cancer or heart disease. So how do you jibe the fact that something is a disease or an illness with the fact that its core symptom is a behavior? You cannot have a substance use disorder if you don't use substances. Uh, makes sense. So how, how do these two things fit? And I think this is really where people have a hard time understanding addiction. Even people who are experiencing it, I think, sometimes have difficulty with this. That I'll hear people say to me, why can't I just stop? I hear this from family members. Why can't they just stop? Sometimes I'm even guilty of thinking this myself, thinking, why can't they just stop? Next slide, please. So a couple of things. And what I want to talk about and hopefully convince you about in, in a brief 15 minutes is how addiction impacts choice. So if we think about from, from the very beginning stage, we're going to walk all the way through. If you think about the decision to use a substance to begin with, we think about choice, one of the things that impacts choice is our access to information. It's, it's impacted by the quality of information that we have, the amount of information that we have. And one thing that we do know, of, of all the things that predict whether or not someone is actually gonna pick up a substance for the first time, one of the biggest predictors is actually how risky do they perceive it to be. Seems like a pretty simple idea. This seems like a pretty risky thing, I'm gonna be less likely to do it. And this is actually, this is marijuana data, I won't talk much about marijuana. But what you can see is this is data from early 1970s up through, this goes through uh, 2011, that when perceived risk of marijuana use goes up, use goes down, and vice versa. So this, this can be a little bit of a gateway or a barrier to whether or not someone's gonna use. So this can impact choice. Now if you think about if someone has a limited access to information, or if they're in a social context where a lot of other people are using, and I think, okay, that person's <coughs> using and they're okay. How bad can this be? This is certainly an issue now when we look at, actually a lot of people who are using heroin now started with prescription opioids, prescription painkillers, which how bad can it be if it's in grandma's cabinet? So this is one thing that impacts choice. Next slide. When we think about actually using substances, now not, not all substances are, are addictive. Now why is heroin addictive and Tylenol isn't? And really the key here is whether or not it engages the brain's reward system. So this is something naturally in our brain that marks whether or not something's good. So you think of natural re rewards, things like food, social contact, sex. These things engage this reward system in the brain and they say, good idea, do that again. <laughs> and uh, the main chemical that we're talking about there is one called dopamine. It's a neurotransmitter that gets released in the brain when we do something pleasurable. And this is what distinguishes a substance of abuse from something pretty benign that if I use a substance, that pleasure center in my brain goes crazy. And one thing you'll see here, so if you look on the, the left there, that's a depiction of dopamine in the brain when you're eating food, which is okay, this is, this is pretty good, this is pleasurable. On the right, you'll see a depiction of when you're using cocaine. So you are talking about your brain's reward system just getting flooded, going into overdrive. And one way that you, you hear a lot of people describe addiction is it hijacks the reward system in your brain. <coughs> it takes this system over. So wh what does this actually mean? Next slide. It means that all the natural rewards, the stuff that we might like, ice cream, for example, uh, food, social contact, activities, exercise, 
all of that seems like small potatoes next to the drug. So you have all of a sudden everything else seems not that enjoyable. And this is where you see people really just go after the drug, hyper focus on the drug, because it's so much more enjoyable. And you'll hear a couple of lines about this, about comparing, uh, it's actually comparing drug use to orgasm in the, in the film, um, to keep an eye out for. Next slide. <coughs> what happens over time, and this is one of the, the really good things about our brain that sort of goes badly in this situation is our brains adjust, our brains can learn. So what happens is when you are pounding away at that reward system, when you're putting this into overdrive, is your brain will actually make that system less sensitive. So what does that actually mean? So that means that it will actually take more pleasure, it will take more of that chemical dopamine to feel that pleasure. So you'll see here uh, on the left is a brain of someone who's not using substances, on the right is actually someone who's uh, using methamphetamine, and what you see is this is their, their dopamine receptors in the brain, which means there are fewer of them and they become less sensitive. Okay, what does that actually mean behaviorally? Next slide, please. Is, so if you think of how you feel in general, you know, how we would hope that most people feel walking around is what we call euthymic, which means generally pretty positive, you know, I, I don't feel great, I don't feel bad, but I'm sort of generally at an even level. And when I feel euthymic, when that is my baseline, uh, next slide, what happens when something good happens or when I use a substance of abuse or I eat that ice cream cone, hit the next slide, dopamine gets released and I feel good. That's what's supposed to happen. When you desensitize this system, what happens is your baseline drops. Can you hit the next slide, please? So I'm now in general, feeling pretty low, feeling amotivated, having difficulty finding pleasure in natural rewards, feeling almost sort of depressed, which means that when I use a drug or when I encounter a natural reward, I'm just getting back up to normal. And this is, can you hit the next slide, please? This is where we start to talk about access to options. This is a quote from the movie, our only choice was to keep going, pile misery upon misery. I love this quote from the movie. So it really reflects how at some point, people don't feel like they want the drug anymore, they need the drug. They need the drug to just feel normal. I don't feel good anymore when I use it, I just feel normal. I'll never forget one of the very first people I worked with when I was uh, at BU and I was training uh, to become a psychologist. One of the first women I talked to said to me, I never intended to use heroin. Never had any intention, it was offered to me. And every day since that day, I've chased that feeling I had the first time. And this was years later, and then this is someone who lo really lost everything. Lost family, lost housing, lost her health, lost her mental health, and she was just chasing that one feeling. So you get this sense that over time, people need it. They feel like they don't have other options, that they need it as much as they need food or water. So if we think about access to alternatives, you don't have a lot of options. If we come back to this idea of choice, um, another thing that you'll see d depicted uh, quite graphically is this idea of drug withdrawal. Fear of that withdrawal syndrome, huge motivator for people to continue using. Next slide, please. The other thing that happens, so if we, we've talked about uh, options, we've talked about information. What about the ability to make a decision? So there are a couple ways that we make decisions. Sometimes we make decisions based on our immediate needs, and sometimes we make decisions based on delay of gratification. So I decide to stay in one night and study or get a little extra work done because that'll be good for my career or that might help the people I work with, or perhaps I'll decide to go out to a movie one night, <laughs> hang out, and the popcorn actually smelled awesome if you haven't gotten any. Uh, just a plug for the box office. Um, so, and, where we are on that depends on a lot of different things. And, and people, some people are better at delayed gratification, some people more, more likely to go towards immediate gratification. But one thing that we do know is there are a number of things that might push us more to bias one of those or the other. So if you think about uh, a guilty pleasure food that's maybe not so good for you, that big, greasy, double bacon cheeseburger, for example. You can tell I haven't eaten dinner yet, I'm a little hungry. But that big, greasy double bacon cheeseburger, and you have a salad. These are your two options. So if you've had a good day, 
you know, you're feeling pretty good, things went well during your day, you slept well the night before, you know, you might make one choice or the other. What happens if you have had an awful day? You got in a fight with your spouse, you slept terribly the night before, you're anxious, you're stressed, which one of those are you gonna lean towards? Yeah, that, that big old bacon double cheeseburger is gonna look really good. So we know that things like stress, things like pain, things like sleep deprivation and addiction all push us towards that now thinking. That it actually, by, and, and this has something to do with changes in the brain, some of the dopaminergic changes, that it actually shifts us to now. I just want to feel better now. Bacon double cheeseburger. Um, next slide, please. So what about acting on the choice? So th this is a point, again, you'll see this throughout the movie, that I decide that I don't want to use anymore. I make this choice. Uh, people probably heard the term relapse. You know, they, they define addiction as a chronic relapsing disease. That's probably a term that people have heard before. What happens when you're actually trying to implement that choice? So I say I'm done. I'm done with heroin. I'm going to move on from here. There are a number of things that impact that choice. Um, one of which is, next slide, um, recovery of those systems in the brain. So uh, there are two types of withdrawal that we talk about. The first is the physical withdrawal from the substance. Nasty, nasty stuff, depending on the drug, but happens over a relatively short period of time. It can be medically managed. People can be made more comfortable. The problem is, once you get through that, you're not out of the woods. That a lot of these brain changes take longer to come on board. Things like sleep take a while. Things like ability to manage stress take a while. Things like the ability to feel pleasure from natural rewards takes a while. Um, one, one thing to keep in mind, when you watch the movie, there is a scene uh, where there's bingo being played. I just want you to look at the main character's face in this, in this bingo thing. This, this describes this issue a little bit. And, and we do know that brains can recover. That can happen. Brains do recover over time, uh, and much of the function will come back, but it takes time. So this is part of the issue. Next slide. The other issue is, um, hit the next one again, please. This idea of conditioning. So if you think of uh, any time where you might hear a particular song or smell a particular smell or a particular time of year, that first time of year in the spring when you smell that fresh cut grass, it sounds like we're going to get that in February and not in uh, <laughs> May this year, <laughs> makes me a little nervous, but if you think about these kinds of things that can bring up powerful memories, same thing can happen with drugs. When things are paired with a substance of abuse, they can become powerful reminders. So certainly if I've had a period of abstinence from heroin and I see paraphernalia, or if I see heroin, I may have a very powerful craving state, even if I've been abstinent for a while. But it's not just seeing heroin. It could be seeing a particular person. It could be a particular place that I used. It could be a particular time of year that I used. So you see these number of different cues that someone could be just walking around minding their own business and they get hit with one of these cues and they have this huge craving. You know, I think when we talk about craving, I think people can, can relate to the idea of craving for food. This, this puts food to shame. Forget the bacon double cheeseburger. You're talking about something that is so much more powerful than what we normally experience. Next slide. And one more. The other piece that happens is social pressure. Social pressure in both directions. Again, you'll see this in the movie. The sense that, we hear this actually a lot with our um, young marijuana users who want to try to quit, which is, how am I supposed to quit? All my friends are using. This is all we do. We hang out and we smoke weed. And that's really hard. I mean, if you think about an adolescent trying to go back into that situation and stop using. So you have that sense of sort of social belonging, this social pressure. You also have on the other end, you have social alienation. That, you know, the substance use disorders are not necessarily thought about particularly positively in our culture. And one thing that I think could be a real challenge for a person is you don't stop using heroin on a Monday and earn back the trust of your family that Thursday. It doesn't happen that quickly. You don't stop using on a Monday and have a job by Friday. So there's, there's a real delay in terms of that s social reintegration. But again, you're gonna see that depicted quite nicely in the film. So I can, can I have the next slide, please? So to, to circle us back uh, as we wrap up, to circle us back to this idea of choice. I think when we think of choice, we assume free will. If we talk about choice, if this is a disease of choice, a disease of behavior, I should be able to make my own decision. 
I should be able to choose to use or not to use. But you can see, and, and a number of things we've talked about today show you how choice is being attacked by this disease in many ways. <laughs> that you see drugs being overvalued relative to natural rewards. This is so much better than what I'm experiencing in my natural life. You see a shift to a focus on immediate needs as opposed to long-term needs. Things that are really driven by changes in the brain. You see drug craving, this intense need or desire for the drug. All of these things impacting your ability to choose, your perception of options, the information that you have, your ability to act on that choice. You see decision-making difficulties. One thing that I haven't talked about much is this availability of options. This last one, the idea of hope. And one of the things that, that people will say to me often, I was actually talking to, uh, to someone today about this uh, who struggled with, with heroin addiction himself, and he said, fear is never enough. And I think that's the first gut response that people have when a loved one or someone they work with is struggling with addiction is, don't you know what could happen to you? You're, you're gonna lose everything. How could you possibly be doing this? You're gonna lose your family, you're gonna lose your job, you could lose your life. What are you doing? Fear is never enough. And again, th think of that bingo scene when this comes up. If the options on the other end don't hold any weight for that person, if there isn't hope for what life looks like without the substance, gosh, is this a hard battle for people to fight. And sometimes I'll actually hear people, and this always makes me nervous, hear people say, my, my life is over. My social life is, I know I have to stop using, but nothing's, nothing's gonna be enjoyable anymore. I can't be social anymore, I can't have fun anymore. I worry about somebody like that. When you can't see that on the other end there is some kind of hope for contentment and joy and fulfillment in life, this is an exceptionally hard nut to crack. So as you hear this, the, the dialogue throughout the film about choice, keep in mind how the way that we might normally think about choice is really being impacted. It's being impacted by the drug, it's being impacted by social pressures, it's being impacted by changes in the brain with chronic drug use. So you see a behavior that on its surface makes no sense. What are these guys doing? That is really, really something that's being driven by an illness, that's being driven by something that people don't have control over. So be careful about equating choice with control. So as, as a clinician, I have to end on this note. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, treatment gets a little bit of a rough ride in this movie, so I have, to, I have to give a plug for treatment, which is we have treatments that are really effective, treatments that can really help people. If, if you yourself are struggling with any substance use or if you know anybody who is, um, I, I've put a couple resources up here. I'm also happy to share them with people. Um, th this is also something that's not hard to find. Uh, you can pop this into a search engine and you can come up with things, but um, the National Institute on Drug Abuse has some great resources. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, has a lot of information about how to find treatment. And then this last, the, the Help Online is the Bureau of Substance Abuse Services uh, in the state of Massachusetts. So there are a lot of good resources out there. Um, so I will ignore what the movie says about treatment. Um, to trust, trust me, it's, it's not that bad. Um, uh, and can I have the next slide? Thank you so much, everybody. Enjoy the movie.